Okay, hello everyone, it's Brandon Bornanson here with Sales Secrets from the Top 1%, where all the world's best sales experts share their sales secrets to success. And I'm thrilled, absolutely thrilled. My Columbus native here, Amy Franco, author, keynote speaker, her newest, latest book, The Modern Seller, which is an Amazon bestseller, new release. Amy, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, and I gotta tell you, I love that intro. I think I'm gonna have you introduce me at all my future keynotes. I did. <laughs> Bring me. It's a, it's a deal. I'll uh, I'll be your uh, hype man. I'll love be your it. hype man. It's a deal. Like like pause every speech that you get, every keynote that you give, and be like, all right, guys, yeah, cheers for Amy Franco. You are hired, my friend. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much, by the way, for coming here. I know you're on your book tour. The modern seller is like wild all over Amazon. Everyone's going nuts, this new digital economy, and you're figuring out how to educate people on how to sell. For the audience that doesn't know you or may have just read the book or just bought the book or is thinking about getting the book or doesn't know about the book, you tell tell people who Amy Franco is and a little bit about your bio and background. Yeah, so let me fill, fill in a little few blanks here. So uh, from a professional standpoint, I got my start in sales working at companies like IBM and Lenovo. Awesome. So I come from kind of that uh, traditional B2B selling background, but but in the technology space. And I had this mix of commercial accounts, public sector accounts, I, I was all over the board. But um, sold a uh, PC technology. Okay. So that was really the first 10 years of my career. And then um, decided to take a big pivot and become an entrepreneur. So that was uh, about 2007. Okay. And uh, started awesome. my own consulting practice and uh, took a pivot into learning and development. And so what that looks like now is I work with organizations on um, sales training, strategic selling programs, uh, keynote speaking, and uh, and then, of course, the new book that just came out. Wow, that, that's incredible. Now, doing like enterprise sales for IBM and Lenovo, mm -hmm. um, what encouraged you to just say, you know what, I'm done being a top salesperson and I want to launch my own kind of consulting firm? Yeah, you know, I am. I loved working at IBM and at Lenovo. And I'm an crazy. IBM grad, by the way. So I'm an nice. IBM Interactive salesperson alumni. That's right. That's um, right. So I, I could relate to the good and the bad, um, you know, a lot of each. And, um, but yeah, go ahead. So you're selling for them? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so, got my start at IBM and Lenovo and you know I had always wanted to either lead something or start something I, I swear I don't even know like where that came from it's just something I think has always been with me okay. and I just it, the right opportunity came along to to make a change make a pivot and I really remember thinking about it I was 30 31 at the time wow, that's and I remember thinking you're, you know what? you're 32 now right? Oh, right exactly thank you <laughs> my hype man um, I just remember thinking, I don't want to look back in 10 years and say, I really wish I would have given it a shot. Wow. So that was, I, I really consciously remember thinking that, and that was probably the last like little catalyst that I needed to say, all right, I'm going to leave this B2B selling behind, and you never stop selling. It's just a different kind of selling. It's much more entrepreneurial and bootstrapping and yeah. Everything you don't I have learned, all those resources. Right. Everything I learned, though, in B2B selling, I took with me into entrepreneurial right. selling. That's that's incredible. Uh, I'm just making sure we have this still run. All right, cool. Just min just minimize, good. And we want to look at that in this. Okay. Wow, that that is absolutely incredible. So when it comes to, by the way, was it hard for you to like take the pay cut and jump? Oh yeah. Because that was. that was one of the biggest, like the hardest things that was holding me back was like, ah. Uh, being a top 1% salesperson like you were at Lenovo and IBM, to give that all up and like not make any money for however long it takes to launch your consultancy. Like, walk, tell me about that. Like, yeah. what was the, the strategy or approach? And oh my gosh, I do remember. It's, um, I think especially in sales, a lot of our identity is wrapped up in our success. Mm -hmm hitting quota, exceeding quota, crushing quota, whatever that looks like. But we get Absolutely. wrapped up in that. We're, we're competitive. I'm type A. I'm competitive. Um, so I still remember the day that I called my boss and quit my job. Oh. I was so scared. I probably dialed the number and hung up like three or four times. Because wow. he wasn't here in Columbus. Wow. My boss, I think, was in like St. Louis or something like that. Okay. So this was a phone call. 
right? Yeah. So like, and you did you guys there like Zoom? Zoom, I don't even think was out like 2007 no. uh-huh. or. No one was using video like that. That was just recent. Yeah, no one's using. So you no can't do a using, video call, right? No one's call. using video like they are today. So this is like a phone call, and um, I remember being so nervous. But I finally, it's like, well, it's either today or or never. And I finally just made the phone call and I talked to him about it. And uh, to his credit, he was so excited for me. That's awesome. And taking this new path. And, and on one hand, he was like, I'm so excited for you. On the other hand, he's like, oh, my crap. He's like, I don't want to lose you. And that was the nicest compliment I could have gotten. That's awesome. But that it was really fun. encouraging. But to your question about the, the paycheck, yeah, it was hard. But I'm a planner. I'd had a couple good years and, you know, socked away a few commission checks. And, and I planned that out. So uh, for anybody that thinks, you know, it was a spur of the moment kind of thing. If you're thinking about doing something like this yourself, it wasn't. I did a lot of planning yeah. and made sure that I was ready to, you're never totally ready, but ready enough to say, all right, I'm going to take this chance. And I remember thinking, all right, what's the worst thing that could happen? It's a total crash and burn. I hate it. I go back and get a sales job. Now, of course, that was before 2008. So a little ignorance is bliss, but yeah. I just had to look at it that way and be like, I got to take this chance on myself. That's awesome. Yeah. And when it came to, yeah, th- there's this quote, I- I'd rather try than, than look back and regret not yeah. trying. Like, I'd rather just, like, try and fail than not take the shot at all. 100%. Uh, and, the, the like, I feel like a lot of entrepreneurs and salespeople, like, that have started companies, they think that it's just like, oh, you just jump in and then you figure it out. Like, you're doing all this planning and putting money away and you're thinking about, okay, who, who are the clients that I'm going to go after? I, I assume when you launched, like, in 2007, like, did you start, like, slowly building a pipeline kind of before you left to people or just, like, right after, like, just hit the ground running with tons of prospecting and sales? I wish that I was that strategic about it. Okay. <laughs> when, when I – um. When I left and went out on my own, um, I did have a strategic partnership with a training company that was here in town. So I had a client coming out of the gate. So it was just that that one client coming out of the gate. And I was making a big pivot um, from selling technology to going into the learning and development field. So that was one of the things that I learned maybe the hard way was if I had to do over again, I might have been a little more thoughtful or strategic yep. about the direction that I was heading in and what what kind of track could I run on. I eventually figured it out, you know, one step in front of the other, but that took me some time. And, um, and the business has evolved over the last 10 or 12 years. It doesn't look the same today as it did when I started. Wow. That's incredible. And, and when you were at IBM and Lenovo and then running into your company currently, what were the types of like sizes of companies that you were selling to, um, you know, revenue, industry, employee size, types of titles to just so the audience kind of understands they can frame who you were going after? Yeah, yeah. So when I was at IBM and Lenovo, so um, I had a mix of commercial clients and public sector clients. So it could range from the really large 10, 20,000 plus person organization, honestly, all the way down to a small school district. Okay. So it was really, yeah, it was really broad, um, which I loved. And it challenged me in different ways Mm -hmm. and figuring out how to build those relationships in a a number of different environments. So it taught me that adaptability when I did eventually go out on my own. So, so that was a little bit of how that all got started. But, um, as I thought about when I moved out on my own, I really had to start getting smarter and much more focused about the, the types of uh, prospects and clients that I wanted to build, build relationships with. So I didn't feel like I was boiling the ocean. But, uh, but I really had a high comfort level with large organizations, and that's where I really got my start when I started prospecting out of the gate was getting into those huge organizations, kind of the the, uh, the whale hunting, if you will, to, to reference one of my women sales pros friends, uh, Barbara Weaver-Smith. Yeah, I love that book. Yeah. Um, it was actually one of, the, one of the first books I read, like going after enterprise sales companies. Uh, her and Jill Conrad, like right out of the gate, both their books like taught me when I first got into sales about going after the enterprise deal. Yes, you know, that's so funny that you say that because uh, 
Jill Conrad's book was one of the first that I bought. Um, it was Selling to Big Companies. Yes, that was the I'm, first one I read. Yeah. Selling to Big Companies. It's still on my bookshelf. I, I joined IBM and I'm like, dude, I've ran startups, sales for startups. Like, I don't know how to sell the Fortune 500. And I was like, all right, I'll read this book first. Yeah. Awesome stuff. Yeah, it was um, really good. And you had asked me a question about the decision makers when uh, that yeah. I wanted to come back to you. So when I was at IBM and Lenovo, I was calling on your VPs of IT, your directors of IT, okay. but that was my audience. But when I made the shift into entrepreneurship and I made the pivot into the learning and development space, that audience changed. So I was now calling on VPs of HR, VPs of training. Um, and I still call on those in addition to maybe VPs of sales with the, the strategic selling programs that I do. So I have new audiences that I now have to build relationships new with. New targets, new audiences, Everything. new company. Everything. No marketing, no salespeople. Like, you're right. doing it all. Yep. Oh, my Everything. gosh. Sounds as exhausting as, as we're doing it now. Like, <laughs> I can relate. Like, I could see you leaving Lenovo and just doing that. I, th that's incredible. Was it? So you were selling to HR, you were selling, uh, you said salespeople training and then mm -hmm. salespeople. Yeah. So people that buy like sales training, is it, in my mind, I would think that you would go straight to like the CRO or the VP of sales, but that's not the case because the, the training and then HR on the budget or how does that work? Well, and this is, um, this is a great conversation around really understanding your prospects and how those organizations work. So in, in doing doing your homework and making sure you understand the relationships in the organization. So in some organizations, yes, absolutely. Like a VP okay. of sales or a chief revenue officer. What I learned, especially in larger, more distributed organizations where sometimes those processes are more formalized, you may need to be building relationships with the VP of sales, the VP of HR, the VP of training, maybe yep. even a chief marketing officer, because many times all those relationships play together yeah. when it comes to rolling out. It's like a buying committee. And it, a yeah, there, committee. there's a lot of decision by committee. Yeah. A lot of decision by and committee. And that, that kind of leads into your book, right? I mean, selling in the, the, the modern seller, selling in this digital workspace, war space of sales, using all these different channels. Like, tell me about the book, because I, I saw it on Amazon. Why? Well, I picked up a copy because you already told me about it before it was released and uh, was really excited to be a part of it. But tell me about, you know, the premise of the book and give the audience a little bit about some tidbits. Of course, we want them to just buy it immediately, but well, yeah, give, right. give, them some, give them some sneak peeks of it. Yeah, so, so I lay out the framework of the book. I like to think of frameworks. Whenever I'm trying to figure out a big problem, whether it's an entrepreneurial problem or a selling problem, I like to kind of think through what, what's a framework that I could use to help me solve Smart. it and think through it. And that's really how I approach the writing of the book. There are so many great selling books out there. We just talked about a couple of them. Mm -hmm. So many great selling books out there on skills like you know, prospecting, uh, presenting, negotiating, closing. Um, and what I wanted to do is write something that was a little bit different than that, but would complement those kinds of resources. And this kind of comes from my learning and development background. So as I was you know, working with my own prospects and clients in, in doing my own research, et cetera, what I had started to see is that there were these kind of skills behind the skills that can make us better at our everyday selling activities. Um, different ways of thinking, different ways of uh, strategizing that can help us be better at our everyday sales activities. So that was a little bit of the catalyst or that initial thought process behind yeah. the book. And then as I started to dig into it a little bit more and understanding you know, what are people really coming up against, um, not just sellers, but our prospects and our clients. And there's this uh, this kind of new sales economy that we yes. are all... You talk a lot about yeah, that. Yeah, we're all, it, it's that we're all working in. And I like to think of it as this very fluid intersection of things like business dynamics, technology, cultural change. That are really ch it's changing how our prospects and our clients and customers it's changing what they expect of us. Wow. And if we keep doing the same things, we are not going to be successful in helping our prospects and clients be successful, and we're ultimately not going to be successful as sellers. So, so that's one of the the frameworks of the book is the new sales economy and yeah. just what are some of the things that we're all grappling with. 
Um, there's going to be some obvious ones in there, um, you know, information overload, technology, things like that. But there are some other ones in there that, that I think might surprise people. Awesome. Give, give us one, like, that's surprising. Yeah, you know, one that, that really uh, surprised me is I was, was researching and just thinking about my own experiences is this idea of accelerated ROI. Okay. And ROI is really changing. So so just to give a quick example now of I'm, it. I'm like really interested. Yeah, just to give a really quick example of it, um, I was with a banking client. So I was with a, uh, a chief sales officer and I was with a regional president. Okay. And we were probably three or four conversations in at this point, a number of meetings. So you think about their buying process and my selling process. So I'm going into this meeting thinking, hey, we're going to cross some T's, we're going to dot some I's, we are going to work together after awesome. this meeting. Yep. So, so I'm, getting, I'm partway through this meeting and we're talking about different solutions and uh, the regional president, she, get, she gets this real kind of thoughtful look on her face. You know that look when somebody's going to ask you a really hard question? Uh, yeah, you yeah. know that one. <laughs> yeah. So she looks at me and she's like, you know, Amy, she's like, I need to be able to go to my president. I need to go to the corporate president. I need to be able to bullet point out for him two or three bullet points. How is this work together going to make a really meaningful impact and really move the needle on the business in the next 90 days? Wow. And the truth is I didn't have a great answer for her in that moment. And what I learned from that was I should have seen that question coming, first of all. Awesome. Um, so I'm always prepared for that question now. But I should have seen that, that question coming. And But also what I learned was our prospects and clients, they don't work in annual businesses anymore. They may have some big initiatives that are one and three and five year initiatives. But if we aren't helping them make meaningful progress in 90 days, we are going to look like everyone else. And our competitors are very likely in there. If they're thinking about this, they're in there doing exactly that. So the lesson for me was speed okay. of ROI. Clients are not working in annual businesses anymore. They are working in quarterly businesses. And then really getting crystal clear on what they expect. And it can be as simple as asking the question, tell me what are the two or three most important things that you expect to see out of our relationship together? And then every conversation can be about that. Awesome. And it's not just a selling conversation. That's a business relationship conversation that makes us so much different. Yeah, I, I can totally relate at our software company. You know, our investors have us focus on three core KPIs. Our VCs are like, only care about these three. You know, revenue, MRR, churn, and then data, mm -hmm. you know, because we, we're building a search engine. And it, anyone that we talk to, it's, it's one of those three or all three that we're focused on. And, I never thought about, I mean, I'm, I personally always track like daily KPIs and I'm obsessed over them, but I never thought about pitching it as in like ROI is always laid out over the course of a year, but if they don't see results one month, two months, three months in, they, they probably have to think that the program's a fail. Yeah, right. I, like, I love that idea. It's, it's genius. I don't know why everyone's using like, the digital economy, everything's happening so fast. Like a year from now, they may be bought, they may shut down, they, you, you just have no idea. Right, for sure. They might be acquiring another organization, whatever that looks like. Um, the other thing with that lesson was ROI can look different than what we assume. So so yeah. in your world, you're talking about those, those specific KPIs. But if you're calling into a different industry, the language might be different, the expectations might be different, I um I had one person tell me that one of their expectations was a time savings expectation. Okay. Well, I think we make some assumptions on ROIs, like oh, I want to cut costs, or I want speed to revenue, or I want speed to profit, and all all valid. Yeah. Um, but if we ask the question, we might get some different answers. Interesting. Yeah. And, and when you, when you're running discovery, because I I can already tell you, you've got the whole like you're I'm sure your discovery process is like solid, amazing, like w some of those key discovery questions. So it sounds like, you know, what are your expectations for this program, yeah. which you mentioned? What, what are some other, like anyone that's trying to sell any big company, mid company in, at, in the modern seller approach? Because I think discovery is like one of the most important things for any relationship because you don't know what they need, want, 
and even are looking for, it's hard to customize your solution to them. But how right. do you do your, walk me through the importance of discovery and some of those other key pivotal discovery questions? Yeah, absolutely. And um, I, the discovery part of it, to, to your exact point, is the, is understanding what what do they need? Where where do they want to be in a year or three years? But sometimes the discovery can also help to maybe disqualify someone who isn't the right fit for what we do. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so so the way that I like to approach discovery, I, I'm a real relationship oriented person. So I'm going to start uh, whenever I'm introduced to someone or I'm looking at an organization. I'm going to start by getting as educated as I can about their business. I'm going to dig into LinkedIn. I'm going to look at who those decision makers are, or maybe some of the other influencers that we aren't thinking about. I'm also going to look into who do I maybe know that has relationships in that organization that I could get a little bit more educated in that way by connecting with my own network. So I start by doing my basic homework. If it's a publicly traded organization, I will also look at their um, their annual report. Ten days. Yeah, and, and, and at a minimum, I will, and some of this is time dependent too. You don't always have a ton of time to do a lot of di uh, deep digging. Yeah. But I, in a like, minimum. For example, this podcast and this video, we just planned literally, like I was like, hey, I've got a, a two o'clock opening. I know it's last minute. And you're like, yeah, I'll be there. Yep. Perfect. I know, and it's just funny because I was actually in the neighborhood for another meeting, That's so awesome. it all worked out. I'm but so yeah. glad I reached out. I was like, I was like, man, I, I, one of my sales calendars, it was just packed, and then like I had two meetings to drop off, and I'm like, dude, we've been trying to schedule this for a while, so I was like, let's just get it in. So like uh, a situation like this, you're not going to have any month, a ton of time to prep. Right, so, so if I'm in a situation where I don't have a ton of time to prep, at a minimum I'm going to do some LinkedIn research and learn something about the decision makers or other influencers. If it's a publicly traded organization, I might look at the uh, executive summary of an annual report. It's, it's great what you can pull up out of that. Um, you might at least get clean some insight into what some of their big initiatives are and understand if what you do start to make some connections between maybe what I do and what they're looking to accomplish. Is there any connection there? Makes sense. So, so those are some of the things I'm going to do out of the gate. But I always have, when I go into a, a discovery conversation, I always have like three to five questions at the ready. Already. Packed. Yeah, and, and they're high level, and then I do them enough that I can customize them a little bit in the moment. Yep. But the ROI question is a great one. Um, and I guarantee that if you ask that question, they'll be pleasantly surprised that you asked it, especially if you've done a little bit of homework to say, you know, these are some of the initiatives that I've read about what you're taking on. How do these maybe line up against the you know, ROI expectations that you might have for us working together? Um, wow. That was too many words in that question, but you get, you get the gist. Yeah. Um, but I really try to keep the questions. What, what's the outcome that they're looking for? Yeah, what, what's the outcome? Uh, one question that. You can't assume it, right? Like you if, can't. Like no. if you're coaching our sales team, you know, we may want to be speed to market. We may want to be speed to revenue. We may want to increase top of funnel conversion rates, bottom of funnel conversion rates. Like if you don't ask me, how are you going to know? Right. And, and sometimes, like I'll ask that question and I may get some answers where, I don't. I may not know exactly what it is that they're talking about, and I may need to ask them to expand on a, a little bit, and then I make a note. I need to go back and do some homework and get myself more educated on what all this means. Um, but that that's a great question that a lot of people they may or may not be expecting it. They're like, you know, that's a great question, and then that just kind of opens up the conversation more. You have more credibility. Um, so a question that I'll sometimes ask is. Um, if you could bullet point out for me two or three things that are most important to you in a solution provider relationship, what would they be? That's awesome. Yeah. Because um, they'll just tell you what's the most yeah. important like, as long as you ask. And, and sometimes you'll get surfacey answers to that, and that's okay because this is not This is hopefully not the first, uh, the only conversation. It's just the first conversation. Yeah, the intro. Yeah, and, and you, can, you can always come back. Um, so I always have three to five at the ready. Awesome. and. The one thing that I have learned is that you, you really kind of have to burn it with them. They may not be ready for some of those questions. I don't some of them are deep. Like yeah. If someone came to me and was asking about my MRR and my churn and my 
uh, bank, like what, how much runway do I have? Like, I'm not just going to throw that out to No, that, and that might feel a little off-putting. Yeah, honestly, totally. If, if, Completely if, agree. If you and I didn't know each other and I'm hammering away at those kinds of questions with you, that's going to feel like an interrogation and mm -hmm. you, it may, may shut you down. Yeah. So it's really kind of, a, kind of a relationship judgment call on you know, how deep do you go. Um, and that's where I found like those the warm introductions and the referrals make a huge difference. Got it. If I'm so you work you work a lot of your referral networking kind of like social network to get in new accounts. I do. Yeah, I work. I work my. I work with my network, and I have you know, strategic partners. If there's an organization that I'd like to build a relationship with, or I'd like to prospect with, I will do my homework on who I think those decision makers might be. But even more importantly, I'm looking for where I may have some warm connections already in there mm -hmm. that I might be able to leverage those connections or at least learn more about the organization from those connections. Totally I sense. would start there first. Yeah, and, and I used to, like when I started in sales, I would do the opposite of like, oh, I'm just going to cold call, cold prospect and work in. But it's like 10 times faster to just see you know, five people that know that VP of IT or sales or HR, like you were saying, training, and they could just intro. Right, right. So, you know, if you and I are introduced through mm -hmm. someone else, and I may be asking you some of these questions, if you already have a baseline understanding, maybe of who I am from the person that introduced us, and that person who introduced us said, you know, you can really trust Amy. She, she might ask you some tough questions. High credibility. Yeah. Right, but you already have the credibility coming in the door. And the odds of you being willing to be more open with me are a lot higher because I have that trusted introduction. Yeah, that's amazing. So tell me, switching gears a little yeah. bit, tell me a little bit about your motivation for the book and why you wrote the book. Yeah, yeah. So um, the number one Amazon new release bestseller. Says my hype man. <laughs> yeah, the hype man, the modern seller, guys. Go pick it up. Yeah, you know, I got I got so far down. We got so deep into that conversation about discovery. I will come back to the five five uh, key points in the book. But you know, the catalyst for the book for me, I have um, I love writing. So I've oh, always, wow. I've always been a salesperson that loves to like. I feel like you don't see that a lot. So people love to talk. <laughs> As I do love to talk too. I got I got to remember uh, remember when to close my mouth and listen. But um, I love writing. It's always something I've always enjoyed doing. And writing the book is, I joke, it's kind of one of the, like a 20-year goal and a 20-year project. I've wow. always wanted to do something around the book. Mm -hmm. And this just happened to be the right timing, the right catalyst. Um, I had made some changes in the business. It's just the time to do it. Oh, you know, wow. sometimes That's things amazing. just come down to timing and opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, you, do, you do all the prep work. But what is that saying? Success is where hard work meets Inside opportunity. Yeah. I, and I think that was this book is a great example of that. Just like a lot of everything that you learned and, and saw throughout your career and the clients that you helped and then throw it into the modern seller. And I think my, my background of B2B selling, and I still do B2B selling, but my background of that traditional environment and then the entrepreneurial environment I'd like to think it gives me a little bit of a unique perspective, yeah. and um, I also sell professional services. I sell a professional service. Um, I when I I'm selling and I'm also doing delivery. So there, there's so it's I know. So stressful. Yeah, it, it can be. Um, doing and, both. Yeah, it can be stressful, and I'm looking for, looking for one of my strategies for 2019 is is using more technology to scale. Okay. But um. But yeah, so I understand a lot of different environments because I've taken a lot of different pivots in my career. Yeah, so you've done the, the tech sales, you're doing the professional services sales, yeah. and you've got the entrepreneurial view, launching your own company, you know, for the past decade. That's incredible. Um, and then for anyone that wants to buy the book, where, where can they go to pick up the modern seller today? Yeah, so the best place to go is Amazon. So right. that is out there. Um, and then um, if we work directly, I, I will usually, um, keynotes, uh, speaking engagements, we'll work with organizations directly on that. But for those of us, those listening out there, Amazon's the best place to go. Awesome. Yeah, I love Amazon. So it's too easy. It, it's so addicting to just buy everything in one click. I know, right? I, uh, I buy a lot of, I got to stop buying a ton of books that I don't read. Like I'll buy like 50, read 20, and then I'll, I never get to the other 30, and then I do it again the following week. 
Well, I think what's so interesting about about the Amazon is this uh, kind of this idea of the Amazon effect and how it is making its way into B two B selling, mm -hmm. and a lot of our expectations around speed and ease of use and ease of buying. Instant, instant, yeah. instant. Um, that that type of sort of B two C environment. Those behaviors, you know, we're all people. We bring those same behaviors into our corporate environment. Yeah. And so it may or may not play in every scenario, but it it pays to be aware of it. Totally. Because our those behaviors that we now have in a tech world come to our everyday, you know, corporate life. Wow. Yeah, I completely agree. And um, just because our readers are dying, so. Sales secrets from the top 1%. Yeah. The world's best sales experts share their secrets to sales success. You know, you've had a, an immense amount of success at IBM, at Lenovo, at um, running your own company, launching the book, you know, uh, new release, bestseller on Amazon. Like, everyone's dying to know. And, and we keep it to one secret. Like, what is your sales secret to sales success. If you had to pick one thing, what would you say that is? Because Brandon knows I can say like three or four. So he's looking at me saying one. <laughs> one thing. Um, social capital. Okay. Yeah. What is social capital? So I like to think of social capital as the collective value of our networks. Interesting. So modern sellers, uh, well, first let me say, social capital is never going to be something that shows up on a P&L. Right. But, huh. you know, some modern sellers and modern selling organizations who really get the value of social capital, they know that their relationships and their networks have really tangible value, that they just couldn't be successful without them. And I really believe that the, the value of my relationships directly impacts the sales results that I can accomplish. And, wow. and the bigger goals that we have – that we want to accomplish, and I think modern sellers have big goals. The bigger and more significant the goals that we have, the more that we need social capital and we need our networks to be able to accomplish those. We can accomplish bigger, more significant goals and we could do it more quickly. And it's so much more rewarding. Wow, and so social capital, completely agree, love it, relationships are everything. Because the modern seller is that you know person that's always striving to get to the next level, Anyone that's reading this book, Sales Secrets from the Top 1%, they are a top 1% or they want to become a top 1%. How does one build social capital? Like, what is, how does one go about doing that? Yeah. So, um, so yeah, I completely believe that the one top 1%, they are phenomenal at building relationships and leveraging social capital. And if you're someone listening who is wanting to get there, this is, this is a great way to, expand your skill set to get to this one percent and here here's how I like to go about building social capital this could be a whole like long conversation it book could be a whole book in and of itself but I kept it to a section in the book the social section the modern seller is social and believe it or not in the book I don't get into any technology interesting I love yeah, that I don't get in, into any there's technology. so much technology now yeah I, right now they, they did the MarTech landscape 7500 MarTech company isn't that crazy? The sales tech landscape, twenty five hundred companies. Yeah. What? Yeah. So, so this is a this is kind of a low tech answer, if you will. Love it. So again, I like to think in frameworks, and one of the things that I learned when I made the move from IBM and Lenovo mm -hmm. to being an entrepreneur, my network was not anywhere near what it needed to be in order for me to be successful. I was great at building relationships inside IBM and Lenovo. I was great at building relationships with the clients that I had, but I had to learn a whole new set of skills in order to be able to grow and expand the business. So a lot of what I've learned about social capital has just come from the things I needed to teach myself. So I, 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 there's a framework in the book, and it is a social, social capital framework. But I, and I'll point to two things in there. The first is, really knowing what your most significant business development or sales goal is for the year. So if we just keep this to a selling conversation, you need to know your top one or two big goals that you're looking to go after. When you know what those are and you're really clear, then you can start to figure out what relationships do I need to build and add value to in order to help me accomplish that goal. Um, we never accomplish any goal by ourselves. 
like my book, that was like a village to yeah. get that book done, right? I bet. Um, so, so I start with thinking about the goal, and then relationship building can feel like boiling the ocean. Like, okay, I get it. I know I need to build relationships, but where do I even start? You know, we both have, between the two of us, thousands of connections on LinkedIn. Yeah. But you and I don't have thousands of really close relationships. So it is figuring out where do I have connections that I then need to turn into deeper relationships. So I look at um, network ecosystems, okay. and I start to look at, for my biggest business development goal, what are the different types of relationships that I need to be building? So this might be with strategic partners. This might be with um, with uh, different uh, centers of influence, both inside an organization and outside. Maybe there are board of director relationships that I need to be building. I start to look at the networks I need to build and bounce that against my goal. And then I start to look at who are the people that are in those networks that I either know or I'm somehow connected to that I can start to build relationships with. So, so that, that that's high level, but that's where I start with the goal and with the network ecosystems that I'd like to build. That's incredible. I feel like you're extremely strategic with the modern seller approach. Like all of that that you talked about, laying out every single individual user, influencer, budget holder, uh, buyer, decision maker, and, and even externally, internally, mapping all of those out, then looking at social connections, then looking at building relationships with everyone involved. It sounds like incredible, but it also sounds a little exhausting. How, how does one that's looking to become a, you know, part of the top 1%, yeah. like where would you rec you could get overwhelmed really quickly. Absolutely. Where do you recommend kind of starting? Yeah. So, so if I am, so if I bring this back to a goal, so let's say that the goal is, um, let's say your goal is you are looking to break into a certain industry because you know that if you can break into this certain industry and get some really key cornerstone customers or clients in that industry, maybe it can catapult you to that 1%. Wow. So that's something specific, tangible that you can wrap your head around um, because to your exact point, that is a lot of work. I do all of that to some degree. Okay. But if I were doing that all the time with every single relationship, I mean, you'd never get anything done. Um, so that's where I should take a look at it and say, all right, let's say I want to break into an industry and I want to land, you know, three, four, five clients in that space. Mm -hmm. That's my starting point. And then just for though that industry, I can start to apply this just to that industry yeah. and use it as a springboard. So you're keeping the focus narrow so you're not making yourself crazy trying to do this because it, it, it can be exhausting. So it's being really focused with where you apply it. Got it. So kind of like picking an inch and getting rich. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And, and so relationships, this, the top sales secret is you have to develop social capital. You have to develop relationships. Um, the best way to go about doing that kind of at the beginning is – to develop the hierarchy and organizational structure and then just start, what would you do then? Like, let's just say there's, you're going into an account, you've got 25 or 50 people that yeah. are part of the deal, part of the committee. Uh -huh. um, w once you've identified them, kind of what's that, that ground to start booking appointments and generating revenue? Yeah, so, so let's say, let's take that example of a single organization. So we can kind of boil this down to a single organization and you're looking to either break into that organization or you're looking to expand your reach already within that organization. So yeah, so what I would be doing is I would look at that organization, I would look at my different network networks in that organization, my decision makers, my centers of influence, um, my maybe external strategic partners that are already, that could maybe help me build some relationships. So I'm going to look at those and I'm going to fill in two, three, four, five names of potential people that would match that criteria. Um, and then that gives me something very specific to focus on. I'm not trying to build relationships with a hundred people. I'm trying to build relationships with a small subset. So now that I have my, my list of names and I know, okay, 
you know, Brandon is a decision maker in this organization, and, you know, I need to get to know him, and I need to build a relationship with him. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to look at how am I connected to him? I'm probably going to go to LinkedIn, and I'm going to say, how am I connected to him? And if you and I share 10 connections in common, and one of those connections is someone that I know really well, I'm going to maybe ask for an introduction to you. Makes total sense. But I'm going to be really smart and strategic about my introduction. It is not just saying, hey, so-and-so, can you introduce me to Brandon? It's going to be, hey, so-and-so, I've done my homework about this organization. I think Brandon is somebody that I could build a relationship with. And I'm going to give you two or three bullet points to help introduce me. Yeah. I never kind leave like it. Write I never the leave it for them chance. and deliver the research. Yep. And um, here's yeah, why. Yeah. Here's why I think I'd be a, if this would be a good potential conversation. And here are a couple bullet points to help introduce me, yeah. so that I take all of the hard work off of that person's plate. I love that. I, I think that's the most critical part of an intro. Is people like will ask for intros, like, "Hey, can you introduce me?" It's like, do you know how many meetings I'm in? Mm -hmm. Like ten thousand meetings. I got a hundred emails every hour. Yeah. 30 to 100 right. LinkedIn messages every four hours coming in. Like, I love the idea about you have to frame up, like, here's the script that you can use to interrupt me. Here's the value that I'm going to bring to the person that you're going to introduce me to. It kind of makes the, the person that you're asking the intro for, like, wow, this, this person that wants the introduction, like, really cares about this other person in my network. Yeah, right. And, um, it, and they care about me too because if I make and, and I'm somebody who makes a lot of introductions too, and I think you're probably the same way. Mm -hmm. I do it because I, I like to do that for my network. But I hate spending thirty minutes or an hour trying to figure out, and I don't do that. What would I even say? Yeah. Um, where you're taking the guesswork out of it, you're making it easy for the other person. And oh, by the way, now that Amy's been introduced to Brandon. You now know something about me. You know my level of thoughtfulness. You know what I'm already thinking about before we even yeah. reach out. And your odds of taking a phone call, a video chat, or a meeting with me just skyrocketed. Yeah, I love that. I, and it, it breaks down the barrier and the wall. Like, yeah. It, you just have to make it stupid simple. Stupid, and that's, stupid simple. And that's where the social capital starts to get built, right out of the gate. I've now built it with my the, into the person who's introducing us. I've now built it with you, and now I have an opportunity to continue earning credibility with you. Yeah. Um, and I, sometimes uh, we make it a lot harder than it needs to be. I'm always uh, asking, how can I make it as easy as possible on the person who's introducing me to make them say, oh, yeah, I'd be happy to do that. Yeah. As and, I use that approach like when trying to book appointments. Yeah. Same with intros. You have to. And, uh, and that's the start of social capital. And when you, if you take an organizational approach or an industry approach, it, it, it keeps you from feeling like you're boiling the ocean and you're making really meaningful connections, right. meaningful relationships. You're not trying to be like out here building relationships with tons of people out here. You're being really specific and focused about it so that they're the right relationships. Yeah, I love that. Because you got to do the right things to get to the 1%. Anybody can run around crazy busy and doing all kinds of selling activity or what they think is selling activity, yep. but is it the right stuff? Interesting, yeah. I completely agree. And how, what percent of sales teams, salespeople, marketers, do you think are taking the time to even look at the prospect and look at the mutual connections and asking for an intro? Oh, gosh. You know, I have to say it's probably a fairly low percentage. I don't know if I could put a number on it, but I do get my fair share of LinkedIn messages that I can tell that someone didn't do their homework mm -hmm. or it's something where I get sent an invitation to connect and then I start getting this barrage of Blast. kind of spammy messages That's or brutal. I can tell that they didn't even do five minutes of work. Yeah. Um, I'm going to guess it's probably a low percentage. Yeah, I bet you it's like 5%. Yeah, it's... I, I don't even sometimes like I'm not perfect with it. I'm really bad with it actually. Like now that you bring up the importance of social capital, I'm gonna go back to my company and be like, guys, like if you're trying to break into an account, make sure you check mutual connections to the DMs and influencers and users based on your advice. Make sure you have scripts ready to go to get introduced. 
And uh, I think that's, that's a phenomenal sales secret that's untapped, like exponentially untapped out of the majority of sales secrets. Like salespeople just want to go and they want to prospect, they want to execute. And like, that's the hardest way to go. Totally. The easiest way to go is to work your network to get into the account. And f for a real world example, like this is giving me deja vu, guys. When I started fundraising for Seamless.ai, the world's best sales leads, I was like, I'm a top 1% salesperson. I know how to sell. So what did I do? I built a list of 22,000 venture capital firms. Oh, just 22,000? Just 22,000. And then um, we used Seamless to build all the uh, venture capital partners, general partners, all the personas, right? Yeah. Everything that you're talking about, build the committee. And then like, we literally just went after everyone cold. Like, oh, you know, we, we closed a lot of funding in Columbus here locally where we're at right now. Closed a lot of funding in New Jersey and San Francisco, but like it took probably three to five X longer going cold, five X longer going cold. Because if you're asking for people to give their money to you, like they just don't trust you. No one trusts you. Sales, like going cold after sales is easier than going after trying to get them an investor to open up their bank account. And I, that my biggest regret with fundraising and probably with sales now that you bring up the sales secret is like work the network. Like I could have closed a deal instantly if I just had someone that they knew and liked intro me to that VC, intro me to that big enterprise account. It's incredible. There's that, um, what's that statistic? It's like 84% of decision makers start their, pro their decision making process reaching out to someone that they trust to ask for some kind of referral. Yeah. Um, and I don't remember where I saw that, that figure from, but it makes a lot of sense. We think about our own behaviors. Mm -hmm. We're looking to buy something and we're looking for a service. What do we do? We call, text, message. Post on social media. Yeah, um, email people. Or people that we trust to say, here's what I'm looking to do. Who can you recommend? Yeah. Um, I just got an email today saying, like, we showed up in a random decision maker forum and People were talking like they love the product, and uh, it's, it'd be like that stuff just happens like without you even knowing it. Yeah, right. And that that's that um, that, that third party credibility that's happening yeah. when you're when you're not even in the room. That's also a byproduct of social capital. I was just about to say that's social yeah. like because social capital is in, like has this exponential effect. Like even if you're not there, it could be driving revenue and business opportunities for you. Absolutely, and um, one of my favorite. Uh, favorite concepts around social capital. This came from Keith Ferrazzi, and okay. um, uh, he talks about how generosity is the fuel of your networks. And I just love that. And I, I always try to remember that, that the more generous we are with our networks, people usually like to be connected or they're looking for connections to um, other people. Mm -hmm. They're looking for connections to ideas, resources. The more generous that I can be with those, those network assets that I've built, I really believe the more that comes back. And it sometimes comes back in surprising ways. You just never know how it's going to come back. Yeah. But even if it doesn't, that's okay too. It, it's the idea of just being generous. Yeah, and everyone's always, the, the people that you're trying to sell to, they care about them, and the people that are selling only care about themselves. And like you have to be obsessed with who you're trying to sell to. Yeah. And how to help them. And, and I think if I could put a plug in for our local community here in Columbus, I, I think we have one of the most generous, generous cities, regions I've ever been a part of. Yeah, it, it's I one of my favorite agree. things about Columbus is how generous and open people are here. Yeah, everyone's open, trying to help. Yeah. Um, versus kind of the opposite, take totally. each other down, cut each other's throats, you name it. That's amazing. Well, Amy Franco, author of The Modern Seller, Amazon's newest uh, bestseller release out on the market. Guys, pick up Amy's book. If you haven't listened, social capital is the sales secret from one of the top sales experts. And Amy, last, last question. I, I know only one question, what's your top sales secret? But if you could tell yourself anything, you know, go back to when you first started selling, one piece of advice. You gave us the sales secret. What would be like just the one last piece of advice that you would give yourself in a, in a, in a tweet, like looking back? 
Yeah, if I were to say looking back and putting it into 140 characters or less or whatever Twitter is now, yes. um, I would I would say have the courage to ask. Okay. Every time I have ever just pushed myself out of my own comfort zone and put uh, put the fears aside and just made the ask for what it was that I needed to move the business forward or whatever that was or whatever I was going after. When I had the courage to ask, that catapulted me more than any, anything else I can think of. Wow, that's amazing, guys. So have the courage to ask. Thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in to Sales Secrets from the Top 1%. The world's best sales experts share their secrets to sales success. Amy Franco, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me, hi, man.